Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Full Spectrum series. I am Nick Valentino. I'm an academic counselor in the Hagem Dean's office, and I'm also the host for this series. Uh, the Full Spectrum series is composed of introductory lectures from our faculty. Uh, this is an opportunity for uh, to ask Hagem faculty about their program, uh, their research, and the types of challenges uh, that they uh, in the engineers engineers in their field work to solve. Um, if you are watching this uh, either uh, now or if you're watching this in the video, you have the opportunity to win a prize. So please put your name in the chat or on the Facebook broadcast and indicate if you are a current or prospective student, an alum, staff, faculty, or another part of the university community. Uh, during the uh, lecture, I will be monitoring questions for the chat and we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, this session is presented by Dr. Sarah Smith. Uh, she's an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering. Uh, Dr. Smith received her PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Rochester with a dissertation on instantaneous frequency analysis or reverberant audio. And I hope I got all of that wrong. Dr. Smith, I am going to turn this over to you. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so that we have something to look at as I'm talking. So this is intended to be just a very quick and general overview of both the field of audio and music engineering and our program here at the University of Rochester. So when people come and are curious about audio and music engineering, their first question is generally, what is audio and music engineering? It's not a program or a field that's present at every university across the country. And so First, I will aim to answer that question. I will then continue on and talk about both the field in general and what we do here at the U of R and conclude with different ways to get involved. Because if you are a current student who's already picked a major, but still thinks AME is really, sounds really interesting and cool, there's lots of ways to get involved with the things happening in our program and our department that don't require you to major in audio and music engineering. And so, on that note, the first thing I typically get asked by prospective students is, what is audio and music engineering? And probably when students have maybe some idea about, about what it might be in their heads, they picture something along the lines of this. Somebody sitting in a recording studio, potentially recording a band and producing a record out of that session in that project. And that is a very big part of audio and music engineering. However, it is not the only part of audio and music engineering. And what I like to say is that this picture encompasses everything about AME, but it's not just the person at the console. Everything else that you see in this picture and in this room needed to be designed and engineered. In order for this event to happen, somebody needed to go and design all of the electronics that go into the recording console. It required software programmers to program tools like Pro Tools that are used to record and save and edit digital audio. It required someone with the knowledge of acoustics to design and build acoustic paneling for this uh, recording studio. And it required all of the various equipment to be designed and built, all of the microphones, all of the speakers, et cetera. And so all of those kinds of problems fall into our definition of audio and music engineering. And so when I think about this field and this program, I kind of divided into a number of key areas. And so yes, this was the picture I could have just shown, which is that everything in that room is really audio and music engineering, and even some things that are not in that room. So things like Amazon Echoes and Alexa, we're seeing now that really all of our technology is starting to become voice activated. And in order for those technologies to exist, we need people who know a lot about how to analyze and interpret audio and voice inputs. Another major driver in the area, in the industry, is that of hearing aids. We know that we have a large generation that's getting much older and hearing aid technology is getting better and better. And so all of these things become a part of the broader field of audio and music engineering. 
However, we can divide this into a few kind of key major categories. And the first of those is probably the one we think about most, or at least think about first, which is recording and sound design. And we do a lot of this at the University of Rochester. I'll talk about our courses, course offerings and curriculum a little bit later, but there are multiple courses in studio recording and in sound design for visual media and things like that that are covered within this program. On the more technical side, there's a whole range of things happening related to hardware engineering. So this includes traditional fields like building, designing and building microphones for recording and designing and building loudspeakers. But there's also current and ongoing research. So at the bottom right here is actually a photo of a faculty member in our department Dr. Mark Bacco, and he's standing next to a flat panel loudspeaker. And so this has been a project for a number of years in AME to try and design speakers that are a little less clunky than the ones you see in the middle. Something that you could hang on your wall as a picture, for example, and turn that picture into a loudspeaker. And it turns out there's a lot of acoustical challenges to doing that, but it's an ongoing project and one we've gotten a pretty good solution for. So not only could you turn something like a hanging canvas into a speaker, but we could take the sound that's coming out of your television and spatialize it so that if you're watching a movie and two people are talking, the person on the left sounds like they are coming from the left and the person on the right sounds like they are coming from the right part of the screen. And so there's a lot of work both in industry and in research that deals with hardware engineering and audio. And the second counterpart to that is, of course, software engineering. So in order for the recording industry to exist, people need lots of different pieces of software. There's main, main large pieces of software that are used for recording and tracking and mixing, but there's also lots of smaller pieces of software. So the photo in the upper left here is a photo or, or a screenshot, I should say, actually taken from one of our senior design projects here. This was a wavetable synthesizer from a few years ago, and they built and designed their own synthesizer to do certain things that they wanted to be able to record in different sounds and then play with them and manipulate them and use it as a synthesizer. The photo at the bottom right is another example of actually a senior design project that was largely software based and looked at um, augmented and virtual reality. They were really inspired by the piano at FAO Shorts. For those of you who have been there, you can walk around and play the piano with your feet. And so what they ended up doing was using an augmented reality headset to create a virtual piano that you could play by tapping a little handheld controller around the room. And that's an example of the sort of new and research directions that people go with software in audio and music engineering. The third major area here is that of acoustics. And acoustics is an area that I work in, and it's a fairly broad area. Um, it's essentially anything having to do with the physics of sound. And this comes in in a lot of ways. So it comes in in architectural acoustics. So if you come to Rochester and go to the Kodak Theater at the Eastman School of Music, it's a really wonderful concert hall. But when they build that concert hall, they have to design very specifically for certain kinds of acoustics. And that requires engineers and scientists who know a lot about how sound behaves in rooms, who can go and measure a current room and analyze what works well and what perhaps needs to be changed. In smaller spaces like recording studios, you often see these panels that are shown in the middle. And those are both panels that absorb sound or can diffuse or reflect sound in certain specific ways to enhance the sound in that room, to break up certain undesirable modal effects. For instance, we don't want a recording studio to sound like your basement where it's just a concrete box. We want to get rid of some of that kind of ringing metallic sound almost that you have in a big square box and make it into a drier sound. 
And then the last photo is just a general photo that I like. It's actually taken from inside of an acoustic guitar. And I think it does a really good job of showcasing that a lot of the problems we see in room acoustics also come up when we talk about instrument design. Because at some level, they're essentially the same system at a different size and a different scale. And so the next area that I have here is that of signal, pro signal processing. And this is, again, an area that I work in personally. Um, I work both in acoustics and signal processing. I do a lot of signal processing related to analyzing room acoustics in different ways. And so in this photo is where I've shown some of the industry trends in signal processing. There's a lot of research work that uses signal processing, much like scientists and engineers use math and programming to achieve other, to answer other questions or solve other problems that they may be interested in. The same is true here with signal processing. And I think two of the biggest drivers now in signal processing are things like, again, I've shown the Amazon Echo, but any sort of device that you can talk into like Siri or Alexa and have it understand your voice is becoming a very large trend, not just in audio, but in the industry and tech industry more broadly. And the second one is this example of hearing aids. So traditionally, if you went back even just 10 years, a hearing aid was essentially an amplifier. If you were getting older and you, or for whatever reason, were having trouble hearing, you would get one of these hearing aids and it would take the sound that was arriving at your, your ear and it would make it louder. Now, more and more hearing aids can do increasingly powerful things. Many of them are paired with apps. They can let you select which direction you want to focus on. Do you want to focus solely on sounds that are in front of you? Do you want to do real-time noise canceling to remove the sound of a fan in the background so that you can focus on the speech or the other sounds you wish to hear? And so this is becoming more and more a very hot application of audio signal processing. And so those are the general areas of the field more broadly, but I also want to take some time and talk specifically about our program here at the University of Rochester. And if you're a prospective student or a new student who's considering majoring in audio and music engineering, what can you expect if you come here to study AME? And so our program is basically divided as many are in the engineering school here into three phases. So there's fundamentals. You're going to need to take some amount of math and physics. Usually our students take about four semesters of math and two semesters of physics. We also, unlike many engineering programs, do require music. So we require our students to take at least two semesters of music theory and two semesters of oral skills and musicianship training through the music department here, at the, here on the River Campus. And the second, the last part of this fundamentals is that we offer our, our own intro sequence for first year students in audio and music engineering. So I teach an intro to audio and music engineering. We also offer a fundamentals of digital audio class that's offered in the spring semester. And once you finish the, or even while you are taking the intro sequences, the rest of our curriculum largely divides into those five areas I talked about before. We have courses in those areas and we have project-based courses in many of these areas. Our students find that in a lot of their courses, it's not just doing homeworks and exams, although there is a fair amount of that. Many of the courses have some form of final project where students get a choice in what they want to pursue and focus on within their project. And again, as is true across the Hagem School, if you watch other of these full spectrum videos, you will probably see this mentioned there as well. We have a senior design project. And the senior design project takes the full year of senior year. It's four credits in the fall and four credits in the spring. And students form design teams and really do a full design pro 
project and process for their senior design project. And so some of those are available on the Hagen website from the previous years, and I encourage you to take a look at those as well, because they give a good sense of what our students can do when they come out of this program and the skills they've developed along the way. So I talked a little bit about the fundamentals already. I won't say too much more about this. If you're interested in the specific course requirements, I encourage you to check out our website. We have a PDF curriculum guide there with a lot of that information covered. And again, we offer courses in all of these five areas of audio and music engineering. And I highlight in red here, these courses that we call portfolio courses because it's something that we do a little bit differently than other departments and other programs. So in our curriculum, what we do is we have lecture courses and many of these courses do have labs, but not all of them do. However, after our students take, for instance, a four credit course in musical acoustics, they then take a two credit course that we call acoustics portfolio. And in that course, it's primarily geared around them completing their own project. So there are not lectures and homework assignments, but they go through the process of doing a project of their choosing in acoustics. And we do this in three of our main areas, in acoustics, in audio electronics. The audio electronics portfolio generally centers around amplifier and analog effects design. So students will build some type of guitar effect pedal. Is it typical final project for that course. And we also have an audio signal processing portfolio where students do a project with embedded signal processing and building a digital audio effect as a part of their final project. In the areas where we don't have designated portfolio courses, such as the software design area and the recording arts and sound design area, this is because there are significant projects incorporated into those lecture courses. So if you take our sound design course, there's projects all throughout that course that are little mini projects that are also these independent sort of project based work, not just taking notes and taking exams and things like that. And the same is true in the software design courses as well. And the final part of our curriculum is this senior design, like I mentioned. So I have a few photos here of random senior design projects from years past. Again, I encourage you, whether you're interested in AME or any of the engineering programs here at the University of Rochester, to take a look at the senior design website from 2021 or 2020, because all of the projects are up there with a lot more information about what students did and their process. So, but I've highlighted a few of the AME projects here. So the project in the middle is one we are particularly proud of because it turned into a company. And the students did this as part of their final year at the University of Rochester. They decided that they wanted to build a plugin, which is a piece of software running on your computer that would make recordings you make in a modern studio sound like they were on recorded on a cassette and allow you to artificially age that cassette so that you could listen back to your recording as though it was a cassette recorded in the 1980s or had been listened to a lot. And so they went and they measured the acoustical characteristics of these cassette recordings and implemented software in order to duplicate that, that digitally. And they've gone on and formed a company called Aberrant DSP, where they sell this plugin and a few others now. And so they were able to take what they did here in our program and translate it into their own small business. I talked a little bit about the wavetable synthesis that is in the upper right of this diagram earlier. The image in the bottom left is also a synthesizer, and I believe also a wavetable synthesizer. However, this group chose to build an actual piece of hardware. It's running a DSP board underneath inside the box, but can be controlled by physical knobs and physical sliders. Um, the other projects that you see in the top left, this was a project from about two years ago, 
where a group decided that they wanted to have better control of pedal effects for students who don't play a guitar, who maybe don't have time between effects to always reach down and do something with their hand or use their feet in that way. And so they wanted to build some type of wireless controller for these effects, something you could wear maybe on your hip while you're playing, and then you could really quickly reach a button to change something about your effect instead of having it as a pedal on the floor. And so they built that controller and the Bluetooth uh, communication to communicate to the main pedal effect and did all of that as part of their senior design project. The final project I show here was one from a number of years ago where students were interested in building and modeling a version of a piano soundboard and creating a different resonant structure within um, sort of a new piano soundboard. So what you see there is the actual physical soundboard system that's supporting a series of strings, as well as some of the software models that could be connected to it to provide different effects. But I don't wanna just talk about our major, although I think our major is great. Um, because I realized that many students come and they want to major in other things. And so I want to conclude and mention the different ways you can get involved with our program. We do offer a minor in AME. There's different tracks. Essentially, our minor involves about five courses and usually focuses in one area. So most of our minors do a track within recording and sound design and take some of the intro courses as well. Um, but there's also tracks in audio electronics and acoustics and other areas within AME. We do also offer a cluster. So if you are a humanities or social sciences student majoring in one of those areas and are looking for a natural sciences cluster, we do offer a sonic arts cluster that involves courses within the audio and music engineering program. Next, I think a great way to explore AME is to get involved with student groups. I know we have two of our students here who will probably talk, can talk a little bit more about these if there are questions. Our department sponsors a student section of the Audio Engineering Society, which is a national and international organization for professionals working in audio. And there's a very active student society here. Although not affiliated with our program, the campus radio station, WRUR, is also very active and has students from our program who often go and work and work on the technical side of that radio station, running the studios and producing things for radio. So if that's something you're interested in, I encourage you to look up these groups on um, CCC, which is our internal system, if you're a current student, or reach out to officers or members of these groups for more information. And the last thing that you can do is attend events because we host a lot of events um, that are open not only to our students, but to everyone on campus. So like many departments, we often have guest speakers from industry. So these can be people working at companies like Amazon or Bose or places like that. But they're often also people who work in audio for gaming or in the recording industry. And we're trying to bring more and more of these guest speakers to campus to talk about their careers and their experiences in audio engineering. The next thing that we run, and we are thrilled to be back in person with this year, is the open sessions program here at U of R. And what these are is open recording sessions that feature local musicians, and the sessions are run and engineered by students of our program, but anyone is welcome to come and sit in and attend. So it's a combination of watching a recording session in progress, as well as getting a little bit of a live concert. And the student groups that I mentioned on the previous page often host their own events. We've done things like internship nights where students come back and talk about their internships. We've done soldering nights where AES has hosted a learn to solder and solder your own um, audio cable night. And so do keep an eye out for those things. Even if you already have your major selected in something else, we certainly welcome and encourage students 
to attend these events. And so in conclusion, the last thing I want to leave everyone with is all the different ways you can reach us. So obviously we have a website, like pretty much everyone in engineering. If you're specifically interested in our program, you can reach out to Barbara Dick. She is our undergraduate coordinator and she can tell you things about how many physics courses you have to take or will your AP credit transfer into our program and things like that. If there's specific research you're interested in, I also encourage you to reach out to the faculty in our department. We try and be very engaged and respond to student inquiries as they come up. And I've also included here URLs and links to the various um, events that I discussed. So for current students who are connected through Campus Community Connections, CCC, there's a page for the Audio Engineering Society. There's also a website for the Open Sessions project where you can listen to some of the past open sessions and find out more about those events there. And finally, you can follow us on social media because we have a Facebook and an Instagram and those are places where we will be announcing these kinds of events. So if you think this is of interest and you want to make sure you hear about the events that we have going on, a great way to do that is through Facebook or through Instagram, because that's where those things are announced first. And so that concludes my general overview. Um, I thank you all for watching or attending. And so I'm happy to take any questions that have come up in the chat or are happening live on Zoom. And if there's questions that can be better answered by some of our current students, I'm sure they will be happy to answer as well. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, I'm monitoring the broadcast on Facebook um, and I did get a few direct messages on the excitement of the cassette uh, plugin. Um, being a child in the 80s, and the prospect of having that sound without having to use a pencil to rewind it if the tape has been pulled out of the, uh, yes. the cassette <laughs> is, is very beneficial. Um, one of the questions that we had, this could be answered either by you or the students, um, is in the first year, what is, what is the most surprising part of your coursework in the first year? That's an interesting question. I think the most, sometimes the thing that surprises students is the amount of math they take. If they come in thinking that they're going to get into the recording studio right away, they do get into the recording studio starting in the second semester, but the first semester does start out as mostly sort of math and technical, a technical, a more technical introduction to audio and music engineering. Um, perhaps Joe or Madeline can speak to what surprised them about the program as well. Um, yeah, I, I think I can speak on it a little bit. Um, as I, Professor Smith teaches intro to audio and music engineering, I'm also a TA for that course. Um, and I would say in general, it does seem like students are pretty surprised um, at how physics driven the major is. Um, not that it's a bad thing, obviously. I think it's, it's very exciting. I, you know, we learn a lot about the vibration of strings and, and different circuit components and general electronics. Um, but students definitely come in expecting it to be music from the get-go. And our first initial focus is engineering, like physics and math. Um, but as Professor Smith said, we get started with music pretty quickly in the second semester. Um, Go ahead. Uh, I, I think the biggest thing for me was I, I came from a very non-technical high school and I was looking for a technical degree when I came here. So I was excited about the music, but also like very excited to dive headfirst into an engineering degree. And I think I was very excited when I came to, I mean, I took um, 140 with uh, Dr. Baco. Um, and I think on the first day, I was really excited when he gave the overview of the syllabus and all the different topics that we would be covering because I didn't really know what like an intro to whatever class was. Um, and so seeing that like in one class, I was going to cover acoustics and signal processing and circuits and everything like that all in one course. And it was kind of a big fun umbrella to just dip my toes into the water. That was really, really um, exciting, but also surprising to me. Excellent. Uh, 
what is the next big thing for audio and music engineering? What's the next frontier? That's a really good question. I think in AME, and I speak coming largely from a signal processing background, the big things that are coming in that area are really the many, many ways in which artificial intelligence and machine learning are starting to change our field um, dramatically. So they're already playing a major role in technologies like voice recognition and voice transcription to speech, which is what things like asking Siri to answer a question for you and being able to interpret all of that is playing a huge role. It's also playing a huge role in things like Spotify and recommender systems and learning what people like. But we're starting to see it come into the industry more broadly, into speaker systems that you can buy for your house. And then you can set them up with an app on your phone and it makes its own recording and learns the room that you put it in so that it can do equalization to compensate for whatever room you've installed your speakers in. I've seen projects that are trying to do, use artificial intelligence to do sort of an initial mix on a recording. So if you think of like on your phone and you take a picture, there's sort of that magic wand button that tries to just sort of make it look nice. Doing things like that for audio recording to try and create presets and facilitate the process that's being done by the artists and engineers intelligently, I think is a big change and a big driver that's coming in AME. Yeah, if we could also speak on this quickly, I think Madeline and I have, a, have some ideas as well. Um, as Professor Smith was saying, uh, the flat panel uh, loudspeaker research is, is pretty cutting edge right now that we're running here. I know, I mean, I'm not directly involved, but I consider it very exciting. And I like to watch from, uh, you know, watch my other classmates and different grad students and professors that are involved. Um, also, um, something that I think we can all relate to, especially with this meeting as the, you know, with the pandemic and, and Zoom meetings started, um, the optimization of audio quality is a pretty massive, you know, happening in audio engineering right now. And I know it's something that last year's senior design uh, team was heavily involved with um, and it's something that's very important now as as different jobs look to start moving to remote meetings and remote you know different work arrangements um, so I think the the optimization of audio quality is is pretty much on the forefront of technology right now um, and forefront of research and it's something that's not going away anytime soon so um, yeah, we also, for, for people who are more on the, the music side of things, looking for things that in, are involved in AME that are music related, um, I also know that the, the, just the technologi like, technological advancements in the creation of music, I, like Professor Smith kind of touched on, is also something that we've seen. Um, Joe and I actually wrote a paper for Professor Smith's class on singing voice conversion which is where you basically um, do, do like a, a machine learning process um, and you're actually able to convert any person's singing voice and then depending on which libraries of um, voice data that's been prepped and um, you know, used for the machine learning, you can convert your voice into anyone else's. So in theory, I could teach a machine to take anyone's voice and turn it into Beyonce's. And so like <laughs> you could in theory, basically create music from, you know, by people who have passed, you could, you know, record a new like Beatles song if you wanted to, and you were able to use a machine to um, use a library of Beatles music and recreate it almost identically to the original Beatles voices. I mean, it's the advancements coming in just using artificial intelligence and machine learning to make new and different and weird kinds of music is also something that is incredibly interesting. I know at least in my class to a lot of students um, and is something that also is not going away anytime soon. Yeah, and to sort of build on the creative side, the other thing I start to see is that we have a lot more technologies and a lot more accessible technologies now for spatializing audio. And so things that, that used to be done where you're recording a, a record or a song and you're thinking of mixing it and mastering it for reproduction on stereo speakers, 
there's a lot more technologies that let artists and composers and recording engineers play around with the space that they're recreating a song for. Um, this is true also, especially in things like game audio, where sound designers are really not just designing sort of the timbre of their sounds, but the spatial qualities and localization, being able to localize sounds in certain space around the listener. And I think that's opening up whole new creative possibilities in that realm as well. We get uh, a lot of questions from parents, as you can imagine, um, about this, both the primary question is, you know, what could my child be doing now who is like a first, second or third year in, in, in high school? And, and also we have um, first year students who are changing their majors or prospectively changing their majors to AME. Can, can you address both, like what, what you can tell high school students to be doing? Um, like I said, through their parents usually. Um, and what about first year students? So what are the things that they should be doing in the short term just to start figuring out if this is something they wanna do? Well, I think at the high school level, I think is a perfect time to not get too specialized, but don't, you know, don't forget about your math classes. They do come in useful, even if they don't, even if it doesn't seem like trigonometry is gonna be something you use every day. I know in audio signal processing, I use trigonometry every day. So, you know, making sure that you're staying up with your coursework in high school, but also just exploring things around. There's lots of things online of just listening to different things that artists are doing, different sort of new types of music and electronic music. Expose yourself to the different things that are being done in the field and watching things like this to see um, what we do here and what other programs are doing with music technology in the field and getting a sense of what interests you and maybe what doesn't. Maybe you think that signal processing is really boring, but you love the idea of working with circuits and building your own guitar amplifier and things like that. So I think just continuing to do research and explore the field while also you know, paying attention in your math and physics classes is a good help. Um, for students who are here and potentially considering switching majors, you know, I'm a little bit biased, but I encourage you to take the Intro to Audio and Music Engineering course. I think it does provide a great overview of our program. It's also worth noting, we, we, since we now have two Intro to AME courses, one in the fall, one in the spring, those can be taken in either order. So if you're a fall semester student who's thinking it's late to be added or add this course, you are welcome to come in and take AME 141, which is our fundamentals of digital audio course in the spring, even if you haven't taken the AME 140 course in the fall. So you don't necessarily have to wait a full year to take a course in AME. We also offer a lot of elective courses that don't have whole strings of prerequisites. So we offer a course in interactive music programming where students, um, that again is a good sort of introduction to our program. And definitely for current students, I'd say attend events, attend and open sessions, for example, to see if this is something you're interested in or attend something that's hosted by the Audio Engineering Society because those are really quick ways for a few hours of your time you get both get a good sense of what we do here and can meet people and current students who are involved in the program. Go ahead. Um, I, I think I would also like to speak on that for a second. Um, I also highly recommend to high school students looking at um, you know, events or programs or clubs or summer camps or anything like that that occur in your area. There are a lot more in the audio engineering or electrical engineering or engineering in general, um, you know, events, camps, and programs than people might think. Uh, my introduction to the industry was actually a summer camp that I took. I'm, I'm from New York, and so the, the SUNY system has been incredible for me, an incredible resource in terms of summer camps, internships, connections, um, things like that. And so the summer going into my senior year of high school, I took a two week intro to uh you know recording and mixing class and that was kind of like a hey we take a bunch of kids and we sit them down and we show them pro tools and we talk about 
you know, basic, basic signal flow, but it was like my first introduction to, you know, the field and to understanding what goes into the recording process. And even though my degree and my classes aren't entirely now focused, or my, my at least intended career path is not entirely focused on recording, um, you know, I was entering college with experience in, you know, recording and it gave me kind of that head start into like, okay, this is really, really cool. I think I want to do this and kind of gave me a direction that I wanted to take my college career and also gave me a leg up in my classes because, you know, as professors were introducing programs and things in the recording classes, it was stuff that I had already seen before. Um, so highly, highly recommend, you know, there, there are tons of community college. I know Finger Lakes Community College and I took mine through Schenectady County Community College. So if you're based in New York, highly recommend checking out their summer camps, their online classes or everything. A lot of places will offer courses or, or mini camps and things like that that you can go to to kind of dip your toes in the water of more creative things that are a part of the field, so. Yeah, and if I could quickly speak on the, the idea of switching majors, um, I can speak um, on that with experience, I actually started as a mechanical engineering major with an audio music engineering minor. I, I was that through my sophomore year and only um, entering junior year did I decide to finally make the switch for a, a full audio music engineering major. Um, I just like to say to anyone considering that switch, it, I know it's, it's daunting, especially if you've already declared something else or, or you know, you've, you've gone through a decent amount of coursework for something else. It is possible, um, it's, you know, it's not a decision you have to internalize and take on yourself. I reached out to at least three or four different professors and advisors and undergraduate coordinator, coordinators and everyone's extremely helpful and they know if, if you want to switch to something and you're passionate about it, they'll help you. Um, if you're an engineering major, especially the majority of your first and, and even second year are, are nearly identical to AME because you have to get all those math and physics prerequisites out of the way. Um, if you're not an engineering major, I would say even after your first year, it's still switching is easily possible. Um, but I would encourage you to reach out to professors and, and advisors that they will help you. And obviously, I, I love this program now that I've switched into it. So it's a good time. Being one of those advisors, I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for sharing, especially your, your personal story, because it does make a difference to know. Um, that you can change. I mean, that's one of the reasons, that's one of the primary reasons why this whole series started is to know that you're working off your best guess when you get here. And then partway through the semester, especially around this time, is where students start to think, well, hey, maybe I should be doing something else or this doesn't feel right. I really uh, wanna go a different way. And we hope this is a good place for you to start. Um, I will post uh, Dr. Smith's uh, information and information about the AME program um, so that you'll be able to do uh, that investigation. Um, we are available to meet and to talk uh, to you about what your interests and ideas are. Um, so it all starts with you either sending an email or picking up the phone or we can even see people in person now, which is really great. Um, Dr. Smith, I wanted to thank you for doing this. Um, we have students who have been, or we have been having people follow along on the Facebook Live. Um, and we do get a lot of questions after this is posted too. Uh, we'll be posting this on YouTube um, and I believe on Instagram if I can make it work. Uh, <laughs> it might be a, big, a bit of a tutorial for me. Um, so if there's nothing else, uh, we'd like to conclude the program um, and please follow up with us. And we are really glad that you were able to join us. Uh, we will be going again on Friday with the Institute of Optics. Um, I will be posting information on that on the Facebook page. Um, as well. So thank you for attending and we hope you have an excellent day. Thank you for having me.